Welcome back to Better Biomed. Today is going to be the day that we're going to go over something that might not be that exciting, but it's absolutely essential that you understand for your career. We're going to talk about the NFPA 99 2021 version this year. And my last video I did on the NFPA 99 was the 2018 version, comes out every three years. So if you guys didn't know, every three years they make revisions and it's very important that you understand the NFPA 99, which is the uh, electrical equipment code for medical facilities, yada, yada. But anyway, there's a section in there. It's uh, pages 99-99 through 99-102. So it's only four pages. But these pages are relevant to electrical equipment in medical facilities. Let's take a look. And as I go over this, I'm not going to read the whole darn thing, seriously, but there are some points that I have. You see how I put the arrows and stuff on there? That's the, that's the content that I'm going to cover. So these are the main points that I'm trying to get across and maybe open this dialogue up because there's some very interesting stuff that's happening right now for 2021. Let's take a look. On page 99-99. We have uh, in section 10.2.2.3.8, who comes up with this stuff, right? Testing. And it says, the wiring of each cord assembly shall be tested for continuity and polarity at the time of manufacture, when assembled onto an appliance, and when repaired. All right. So that, that pretty much says it up. You have to test something when you repair it to make sure it's electrically sound. That's it. Um... It doesn't say how often you have to test it. It doesn't say what type of test you have to do. It just says it needs to be tested. That's page one. There is some other stuff in there. Read it for yourself, guys. I'm going to leave the pictures down below. I'm going to leave a link so that y'all can just open up these photos yourself, take a look at them, read it, know it, love it. NFPA 99 is the basis for what we do. The next one is page 99-100. See, I skipped a whole page. There's one thing that was on that page that was really interesting. That's it. All right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is relocatable power taps, and they call them RPTs. I guess. <laughs> relocatable power taps, RPTs, shall be permitted to be used to supply power to plug connected components in a movable equipment assembly that is pole, rack, table, pedestal, or cart mounted, provided that all the following conditions are met. Number one, the RPT is securely attached. Well guys, from what I remember, it used to be that it required a tool to remove it. Now it just says that it's securely attached. Hell, a thumb screw can be securely attached. It just, it's not gonna fall off. That's it, right? So uh, I do believe that that's a change. I'll have to look that up just to be sure. But in this version, 2021, it just says that the relocatable power tap has to be securely attached. Okay, and that's a pretty big change from what I remember. The RPT attachment plug must not be connected to another RPT or extension cord. Ah, uh, guys, I see these things plugged in all the time to the back of anesthesia machines because sometimes there's RPTs, power taps installed on the sides or rear of anesthesia machines. And people always have like Bovi carts, ESU carts, like plugged into those, those power taps. You cannot do that. Guys, if you have an ESU cart or Bovi cart that has a power tap mounted to the, t to the cart or a video tower that's got a power tap mounted inside the cart you cannot have that plugged into another power tap okay um that's that's uh old way of doing things i mean that's common knowledge all right that's nothing new but i i thought nonetheless it's important to bring up to you guys okay the sum of the ampacity for all the appliances connected to outlets does not exceed 75 percent yada yada the electrical and mechanical integrity of the assembly and its securement method are regularly verified and documented. Now, this one I do believe is a change because regularly verified and documented, it doesn't say how you verified it. It doesn't state a code or anything that you have to follow. 
and it doesn't say how often. It says regularly. And regularly could mean every two years. That's regularly, as long as it's written that it's, you know, on a two-year PM cycle. That's regularly. Um, it doesn't say that you need to do anything else to them. You just have to check them, make sure that they're securely attached, and make sure that they are verified and documented. So you do have to document that you've done it somehow. Now, I know some people that have inspected these power taps, and they don't put an asset ID on them or anything like that. They just put a colored dot on there. Green for this year, red for next year, whatever. But that's how they document that they've actually verified that power tap is it's got a colored dot. They don't put the power tap on record. Guys, putting power taps on record is such a bad idea. I mean, it's it's a slippery slope. That's what it is. Because chasing the tail on that guy, because power taps regularly break. I mean, they're a very common failure item. And putting it on record, taking it off record, trying to find the stupid thing wherever it's at, chasing down these ridiculous PMs, guys. Power taps. It does not say it has to be on record. It says it has to be documented and uh, regularly verified. Well, it's documenting it by putting a sticker on there. You have documented it. It doesn't say it has to be in you know, a digital record someplace, a CMMS. It doesn't say that. You have documented that you have touched it by putting a dot on there. I thought that was a pretty original idea. Anyway, the next thing, uh, over in section 10.3, testing requirements, physical integrity. The physical integrity of the power cord assembly composed of the power cord attachment plug cord strain relief shall be confirmed by visual inspection. Nothing new, right? Resistance. This is nothing new, guys. This has changed throughout my career, but it's, it's staying the same this year, and that's why I'm pointing it out. The resistance shall be less than 0.5 of an ohm. Under the following conditions, the cord should be flexed at its connection to the attachment plug or connector, and the cord should be flexed at its connection to the strain relief on the chassis. You have to flex the cord at both ends of the cord. You have to. That is nothing new, but a lot of people don't do that. So if you don't move your cord around while you're doing electrical safety, don't even do the electrical safety. You're just wasting everybody's time. Okay. The next um, test shall not. Ugh, I can't talk. Test shall be performed with the power switch on and off. You have to test the device with it on and off. And that means if it has fans, if it has blowers, if it has compressors, whatever, you have to test the electrical safety while those components are running. So if you have something like a Jackson surgical table that has linear actuators at each side. You have to run both linear actuators and the tilt motor while you're doing your leakage checks because one of them could be failing. And I've actually seen that. <laughs> oh, let's see. Resistance tests. The resistance tests shall be conducted bef before undertaking any leakage current measurements. Guys, your resistance check verifies that your meter and that your, your leakage uh, probe is good. If you don't do a resistance check, how do you know that your leakage is any good? You don't even know that your your wire is connected to a good ground. If you don't have it connected to a good ground on the chassis, you don't even have a good leakage check. So you have to do the, the power cord ohms resistance first, okay? Techniques of measurement. The test shall not be made on the load side of an isolated power system or separable isolation transformer guys if this is saying what I think it's saying that means that you cannot test for electrical safeties inside an operating room that's the load side that is the load side of a, of you know it's the, on the secondaries of an isolation system so it's basically saying the test shall not be made on the load side of an isolated power system or separate isolation transformer I'll admit, throughout my career, unless this is a new change, throughout my career, we have done electrical safeties inside the operating room. But this is saying that you can't. Maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but I don't think so. And it does make sense because technically, that's the whole purpose of an isolated power system is that there shouldn't naturally be any leakage from mains to ground because ground's not in the loop. So since there's no natural path for the leakage to go, 
If a device is leaking, you wouldn't know. Naturally, you wouldn't know. Anyway, food for thought. Opening that up for discussion. All right, that's page two. Page three is a big one, guys. All right, this is some of the most important changes out of the whole 2021, in my opinion. And you want, might want to listen up. Um, single power cord supplying power for touch current of portable equipment. If multiple devices are connected together and one power cord supplies power, the touch current shall be measured as an assembly. Well, this is interesting because when I remember doing electrical safeties on, let's say, a video tower, you plug the video tower into your electrical safety analyzer, and then you had to individually test every single component in the video tower for electrical safety. You know, you move your, your ground plug from, from unit to unit. And from what this is saying is they're tested as an assembly, which does that mean that they're still tested individually? Or does that mean you connect your leakage to one because they technically should share leakage? And does that mean that, you know, that's it? That's the end. It's not like there's that much leakage in any of those devices anyway. So are they saying that you naturally just plug your video tower or whatever into your electrical safety analyzer? You plug your, uh, your testing clamp one place, someplace inside that tower, and that's your test. Because from what I'm reading here, that appears to be the case. And 10.3.5.3, touch leakage test procedure. Power plug connected normally with the appliance on. Power plug connected normally with the appliance off if it's equipped with an on and off button. Okay, well, that's what I was talking about earlier. You have to do leakage with it on and off. There's a variety of reasons why that is. Um, but a lot of people only test it with it on, or a lot of people only test it with it off and without motors running. Does it do you any good to check for leakage if the motors, compressor, whatever, is not running? No, it doesn't. All right, so let's see. Touch current, portable equipment. The touch current for cord connected equipment shall not exceed 500 microamps with normal polarity and ground wire disconnected if a ground wire is provided. Well, this one's changed a few years ago. It used to be 300 microamps. Now it is 500 microamps. It used to be back in the day that it was 500 microamps only for uh, hardwired devices, but here we are, um, they're starting to realize that electrical safety tests are becoming more and more pointless as technology advances and we move more towards DC power. So anyway, um, 500 microamps guys, remember that, touch current. Um, the next one, lead leakage tests and limits portable equipment. The lead leakage current between all patient leads connected together and ground should be tested with the power plug connected normally and the device powered on. So that's for all your devices that have ECG type um, connections. Um, the next one down, the leakage current between all patient leads connected together and ground should be measured with the ground switch open and with the ground switch closed. That's kind of a given. The next one. The leakage current shall not exceed 100 microamps for ground wire closed and 500 microamps AC for ground wire open. Dang, could you imagine 100 microamps with the ground wire closed? Whew. I think I'd be checking that device. I mean, I, I almost never see it more than like, let's say 10, 14, 15 microamps you get up to like 50, 60, 80 microamps, and I'm starting to think, what is going on with this device right here? <laughs> I, I would maybe start to check those ground connections or something, because naturally, you just shouldn't have that kind of leakage. And I understand some power supplies and stuff generally do induce leakage, so the more power supplies you have, I guess the more leakage you might incur. But anyway, the next one, 10.4.2.1, can you imagine like saying all these numbers all the darn time? Non-patient care related electrical equipment, including facility or patient owned appliances that are used in patient care vicinity and 
will, in normal use, contact these patients, shall be individually inspected by the patient care staff or other personnel. It does not say that Biomed needs to check patient-owned devices. Okay? So when people say Biomed has to check, you know, the patient's BiPAP or something like that, no, we don't. All that has to happen is for the nurse to check and make sure that it's safe, make sure that the patients have boogered it up, that they didn't spill their coffee inside it or something, and then they can plug it in and use it on their patients. We do not have to be there, all right? It's patient-owned equipment. The next one, any equipment that appears not to be in proper working order or in worn condition shall be removed from service or reported to the appropriate maintenance staff. It's written right in the electrical safety code that anything that's not normal has to be reported to Biomed, okay? So when people are not reporting things, that's not because they're pissing off the hospital. No, they're actually in direct violation of electrical safety code. They're supposed to report any malfunctioning devices, okay? <sighs> okay, the next one. Household or office appliances not commonly equipped with grounding conductors in their power cords shall be permitted provided they're not located within the patient care vicinity. You cannot have the patient's radio sitting right next to the patient. Now, it used to be the patient care vicinity was like five foot from patient center line, you know, something like that. And it created a lot of a stir because there is a lot of devices that had two prong, you know. And the thing is, they cannot be located within the patient care vicinity, all right? Double insulated appliances shall be permitted in the patient care vicinity. Now, the double insulated is when you have a square with a tiny square inside it. That's a double insulated device. Usually double insulated, <laughs> usually double insulated devices have a box inside a box and a two prong power cord. Okay, that's a double insulated device. Oh gosh. Okay guys, this, this right here is the big one. All right, this is the one that we need to talk about, okay? Section 10.5.2.1.1, the facility shall establish policies and protocols to identify what patient care related electrical equipment requires periodic inspection, where applicable, the type of test, and intervals of testing. Did you read that? It says the facility gets to determine what type of tests and how often the device is tested. It used to be back in the day that all electrical medical equipment used to need to be at least touched or inspected by medical maintenance or biomed clinical engineering at least once per year. They have to be touched at least once every 12 months. Well, this is now saying that it's up to the facility to determine their periodic inspection and the type of test and intervals required. So we get to make it up. So you can put it whatever it is, on a two-year interval. You get to make it up. There's a lot of devices that have electrical safeties out there that, why are we doing electrical safeties on some of this ridiculous stuff? Take, for instance, I had several videos recently on those stupid humidifiers, the Fisher, Fisher and Pakel humidifiers. Well, those are type BF devices, all right? There is no direct contact between mains and or any electrical source and the patient. Whatsoever. There's no metal that contacts the device and the patient whatsoever. It does create humidity and the humidity goes up the lines, but in no way does any wire or whatever contact that patient. So why are we doing electrical safeties on this device that never touches the patient? Type BF and most all the cases plastic. And the only piece of metal that's on the stupid thing is under normal use, it's going to be completely covered by the consumable. It doesn't make any sense, guys. Why are we doing electrical safeties on that stuff? According to the code, it's no longer necessary. We could say, nope, risk factor is too low, not necessary. And the next one. All right, guys, this is a big one, too. I got to take a drink for this one. <laughs> All right. 
Section 10.5.2.1.2. Jeez, why do they come up with so many numbers? All patient care related electrical equipment used in the patient care vicinity shall be tested in accordance with 10.3.5.3 or 10.3.6 before being put into service for the first time and after any repair or modification that might have compromised its electrical safety. So this one's saying you don't even test electrical safety on items in the patient care vicinity. It's saying it's up to you. You have to test stuff in the patient care vicinity when it's put into service. So stuff that's not in the vicinity, let's say a, a device that will never be next to a patient, like let's say a centrifuge. You, a centrifuge is never gonna be by a patient, ever. Why would it? That's, that's an incredible hazard. Lab analyzers, man, I could go on and on. There's so many devices, warming cabinets. A warming cabinet is never going to be by the patient. So what it's saying is that if it's going to be in the patient care vicinity, it has to be electrically safety checked when it's installed and then after any modification or repair that could compromise the electrical safety. Now, if you're just replacing a cover on the front, you don't, it doesn't compromise the electrical safety. You don't have to do another electrical safety on that device. That's an interesting one, guys. Let me know what you think. So, uh, it says it right there. It's basically saying that even in the patient care vicinity, electrical safeties are not necessary. So let, let's take like all those patient monitors and pack use and pre-ops and stuff that are mounted on the walls. First off, most of those are outside of the patient care vicinity. Most of them from the patient center line are outside that five foot. They really are. Hell, the edge of the bed is going to be like three and a half to four foot. So it's technically a lot of those are outside the patient care vicinity, but even if they were, it's still not necessary to do an electrical safety on those devices. It's in the code, guys. It's in the code. Let me know what you think. The last page is a short one. There's only two things I want to point out on the last page. One of them is over here in 10.5.2.3.1. Adapters and extension cords meeting the requirements of 10.2.4 shall be permitted to be used. So as long as they're compliant with whatever this other number is, <laughs> they can be used in the facility. And the last point for this video is down here on, on section 10.5.5.1, the laboratory shall establish policies and protocols for the type of tests and intervals of testing for appliances, which means there might not even necessarily be a test. Now, they, they do have other requirements for like their cap inspections. Now, laboratories and stuff, they have all sorts of regulations and governing bodies that will tell them how they're going to maintain their equipment. But, at least as far as the electrical safety code goes, it's saying that the laboratory can establish what types of tests are done and how often it's performed, which is not in the patient care vicinity. They've already made it clear that stuff not in the patient care vicinity is not necessarily needing an electrical safety at all. Hell, according to what I've read, items in the patient care vicinity don't necessarily need an electrical safety. Well guys, that's all I have for you. Let me know what you think down below because throughout my whole 18 year career, it seems like the stringent electrical safety procedures have just loosened up, loosened up and loosened up. and by all means, they should. They really should. I mean, there's only a couple times throughout my entire career that I've seen something that could probably be hazardous. And it was painfully obvious. So, as far as like micro shocks and all this other jazz, honestly, I don't know, guys. Let me know what you think down below. That is the 2021 NFPA 99. And that's pretty much the entire... Um, electrical equipment section so all right guys I've taken enough of your time thank you very much for watching and stay tuned because I have some very exciting news that I'm gonna release to you guys very very soon okay see you next time